Okay. So, why don't you tell me who you are and tell me about uh, your new book. Yeah, so I'm Paul Gilding, just written a book called The Great Disruption, which is basically arguing that we've, you know, we've been talking for 50 years about protecting our children's children, well we kind of are their children's children. So the times that have arrived when the impacts start to come thick and fast. And that's not, you know, it's not the kind of the end of civilization, but it does mean that we're going to have to deal with a crisis. We are going to have to deal with the consequences of our past lack of action. And it means that in parallel, we're going to be having to respond really quickly. Um, and that's kind of the good news in the story, is that even though we kind of all get frustrated at the lack of action by society in response to the obvious and very clear threats, um, we're good in a crisis. And so once a crisis is kind of officially declared, then we'll get to work and it will be more like a walk on a level of mobilisation, I think. And then we'll get to do some very dramatic and very significant changes. Now, of course, it's a real shame that we didn't do it 20 years ago when it would have been easier and cheaper. Um, but the good news is that when we get mobilised in that way, then we will achieve very significant change. So, uh, well, you're from Australia, which is kind of the, yeah. the canary in the coal mine for sure for this. Is. So tell people, you know, here in America, we read and we see some uh, pictures, but I don't think we have any idea, uh, you know, about the big dry and then yeah, yeah. the big wet. No, look, it really is just <laughs> incomprehensibly significant. It's just unbelievable. We had this un just incredible drought, worst on record, that went on and on, you know, a couple of years, three years, four years, and then it just kept on going. And so we had cities, you know, major cities like Brisbane, almost running out of water and having to put in urgently build desalination plants, new pipelines in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Brisbane. So really dramatic, physical and very expensive changes, which of course is what we've always said would happen. If you don't respond, it gets very expensive um, to respond to climate change if you do it late. And that's what's happening to us. But then after all that was, infrastructure was put in place, we had this unbelievable flood. I mean, you know, I sort of laugh about the scale of it because it was so ridiculous, but it was completely tragic. It was like walls of water, um, unprecedented downpours, literally like metres high of water washing away houses, dragging people out of their homes and flooding areas. Like, you know, the area affected was larger than uh, I think France and Germany combined. It yeah. was just amazing. Um, and across a, you know, Australia's a big country and Queensland's a big place. But this, this was just, the, there's so much of the area that was affected. It was like the whole southern half of Queensland, which is like, I don't know, you know over, over a thousand kilometres long along that coastline. And then the part that wasn't affected by that, north of that, was then hit three weeks later by a cyclone, like the yeah. most intense cyclone to hit Queensland in kind of 80 or 100 years. So it, it, and it goes on and on. And then in the same time in Western Australia, we've had really severe drought, um, crashing the wheat crop there, but then and then also really bad bushfires in Western Australia. So all these things are kind of happening at once. And we thought, this is like just too much, you know, like this is just beyond belief. And then this is all like in a few months, right? And then in Darwin, we just had like, I think it was 20, 24 inches of rain in yeah. a day. Yeah, yeah, in, in a couple of days. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, once the, nor the head of the Northern Territory said it was like... Uh, the of once in 500 year event, yeah. no one's ever seen yeah. anything like it. And this is a tropical, you know, place that gets a lot of rain, and they're used to a lot of rain. And even they were saying, well, this is just beyond the pale. This is kind of ridiculous. So it's just, I mean, it's what we expect, you know, warmer oceans, warmer climate, more air in the, water in the atmosphere, faster, more rain, etc. All the things that have been forecast completely on track, a bit faster than forecast, but basically what we said would happen. And for some reason, it's just happened to Australia very fast, I guess, kind of karmic retribution for our coal exports. Uh, yeah, although if there's karmic retribution coming, then the United States, yeah. United States yeah. has got a lot yeah. worse. But, you know, I think, you know, I write Australia is the most arid, habited continent. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of right there at the edge climatically, yeah. at least the southern part. And, and, and a pretty basic prediction of climate science is the expansion of the subtropics. Yeah. Um, but yeah. then you have, as you say, you're, you've got these two zones. You have this tropical zone. Yeah. I mean, the tropical and the subtropical, and the subtropics get drier, but the tropics, yeah. tropics get yeah, wetter. Yeah. yeah. Um, do so. Uh, you know, ten years ago, Australia was in a lot of denial. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. Is it is that really changed? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, the population as a whole is starting to wake up because of these recent events. Um, but you know, we had a bit like the US. We had very very strong uprising in concern two thousand and six, two thousand and seven after the drought. Um, you know, Al Gore's film came out. We had Tim Flannery, big author in Australia, writing his book out there. So really a lot of public concern. Change of government over this issue. Like this is one of the kind of top two or three issues that changed the government. And then concern faded away. That government didn't get legislation through. Very similar to the US again. Um, but I think... So the government is now acting on it more strongly. But there is still this denial. There's no question. Like even with these extreme weather... 
um, we're not getting kind of this a lot of public commentary about climate change as a direct cause of this. They're kind of they're, no, there's no denial of it, but there's no focus mm -hmm. on it, which you kind of expect. So it's it's just the whole weirdness of the issue. Um, and at some point, you know, we're going to wake up and, and recognise just how dramatic it has already started, and therefore respond. So is that one of the reasons you wrote the book? I mean, is your are you trying to spread the message uh, to Australians that? you know, scientists predicted this would happen, yeah. it's happening. And, yeah. and and also, I think, I'm a big, big believer, having had this experience of the extreme within Australia, there is enormous benefit to getting ready, right? There is actually a lot less suffering and a lot less consequence if you're ready for what's coming. And while all of us should be and will be focused on preventing it from getting worse, we have to also start putting energy, intellectual and otherwise, into getting ready for the consequences. And that, I think, is one of the reasons for saying, look, there is a crisis here, in food prices, in the oil prices and so on. And the unrest that we've talked about is coming. And if we get ready for that, if we prepare for that, we can get through that period. If we don't prepare for it, and we kind of get suddenly shocked by it, the danger is you get the sort of political breakdown that we're, we're fearful of, and then you don't have the capacity to respond to the crisis. And I'm actually very confident we can respond. Um, there are going to be very significant consequences, and it's going to get very ugly, I think, in many countries. But we can get through this period if we're ready for it. And that's sort of the main motivation for the book, is to say, look, the crisis is here. You might be ready, you might be aware of it, but the crisis is here physically in the environment now. It's going to translate into the economy via food prices, etc. And we have to get ready for that period because then we can get through it, and then we have to really accelerate our response to prevent it getting completely out of control. Before we follow, I'll follow up on that probably mm. in that, like the next segment. Um, but, uh, why is the power low? Jeez, I just put in new batteries. All right, I may need to put in new batteries again. Um, um, two things. Um, so you're, you're, uh, expecting that we're going to take actions to, to deal with the consequences, mm. but also that we're going to get very mobilized to, to reduce emissions so that yes. we avert yeah. A lot worse because if we don't take action, oh, yeah. then it's going to be very hard oh, yeah. to deal with. You can't, I mean, you can't respond to climate change. That's not a strategy. Like, you can't actually just have an adaptation strategy. It's far too serious for that. There's no chance of that working. But what we can do is say, let's, let's respond to what's coming early, recognize there's kind of 30 or 40 years of lag in this system yeah. coming, yeah. and therefore we, we can't avoid that now. But we can act really urgently to prevent it from getting out of control. And that's where I actually am very confident that once we wake up to the size of the crisis, we'll do extraordinary things. And one of the things that's in the book is a, is a paper I wrote with Jürgen Randers, who's one of the authors of the Club of Rome Limits yeah. to Growth Report from right. 1972, called the One Degree War. And we, you know, we went and looked at it and said, okay, so if we really got mobilised, what's the absolute maximum you can imagine achieving and how much would it cost? And obviously very broadly, you know, broad brush kind of analysis. Um, and the answer was we can get back to one degree, you mm. know, and we can eliminate CO2 net emissions from the economy within 20 years. Um, it's difficult, like a war, mobilisation is difficult, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to destroy our lives kind of thing. It is just going to be inconvenient and difficult. It's not going to be catastrophic and nothing compared to what will happen if we don't do it. So that was kind of reassuring because yeah. it means that once we get to work, we can do extraordinary things. And you know, we work out how you can cut uh, emissions by 50% in five years. You know, now, yes, it requires rationing. Yes, it requires you know that sort of mobilisation that you have to think. It's very like definitely. World War Two. It's like yeah. World War Two. Yeah, but well, hello, we got through World War Two, and people who were kind of at home in World War Two, you know, went through rationing, went through recycling drives to get metal for the tanks and so on, and and went through it okay. So it's not that we can't do that. We just got to decide to do it, and that's kind of the reassuring thing in the process. Now, when I say reassuring. You know, this is against the scale of the collapse of civilization. Right. Not reassuring as in we'll all be okay, but reassuring as in if we get this wrong, we are talking about global economic collapse and the potential for breakdown in a very serious way of civilization. That's what I think we can still prevent, but only if we're going to get mobilized incredibly quickly. All right, let me end that segment.